discipline. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In his political pamphlet, The American Crisis, Thomas Paine described the early days of the American Revolution as times that try men's souls. Paul's last days were lived in times like that, but A.D. 66 was far more trying than 1776. The apostle was locked up in a cold, dark prison in Rome when he wrote his last letter, 2 Timothy. It was his second imprisonment there. After being held for two years under house arrest, he was released, but after further missionary activity, he was arrested again and imprisoned in Rome for the last time. According to tradition, he was put in the Mamertine prison, which was a damp, dismal, underground chamber with only a hole in the ceiling for light and air. He was in chains. His ministry was over. And he had been sentenced to death. He told Timothy, my departure has come. I have finished the race. The church he was leaving behind was in decline. And opposition against it was increasing. Nero savage persecution was underway and people were abandoning the faith. All who are in Asia turned away from me, he wrote. Bishop Handley Mole described the situation as grim, writing that Christianity trembled, humanly speaking, on the verge of annihilation. It's not hard to imagine what Paul must have felt when he heard about the wholesale slaughter of Christians and widespread defections within the church. Asia was the field of Paul's labors for many years, or at least for three years we know he ministered there in Ephesus alone, teaching the Bible, admonishing people night and day with tears. He reminded the Ephesian elders of that the last time he saw them in Acts 20. So how discouraging that must have been to come to the end of his life and see that all he had worked for was being destroyed and being drawn away from the gospel. So when he wrote 2 Timothy, it was a time that tried his soul and the souls of many Christians. But but this is not an epistle of despair, just the opposite. It's a book of hope and urgency. Paul was like those sons of Issachar in 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. Men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Paul understood the times. He knew Satan's strategy and man's weakness, but he also knew God's plan and power and Christ's promise that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. And so even though Paul wrote his letter in the shadow of the scaffold with the church in decline, he still gave a triumphant message. He understood the times and knew what was to be done. That's the instruction he gives to Timothy in what was a very timely letter. It's just as timely for us because the modern church is in a crisis of the same kind that Christians faced in the last half of the first century. Fifty years ago, John Stott wrote that our era, too, is one of theological and moral confusion, even of apostasy. And that still is the case. So, the message of 2 Timothy is relevant for the church today. Its theme is simple but urgent. Be faithful to Christ in a day of spiritual decline. It was written to Timothy, Paul's child in the faith, but its audience is broader 
It has been called Paul's last will and testament to the church. As he prepared for his death, he passes the torch on to the next generation and gives Timothy some final instruction on how to carry on with the ministry. Paul had confidence in Timothy. He'd been converted under Paul's ministry and was for many years his fellow worker in the gospel. Still, of all people, Timothy seems least able to to shoulder the responsibilities the apostle lays on him. If Paul was God's great lion, as Augustine called him, Timothy was his weak lamb. He was relatively young, he was sickly, he had frequent ailments, and he seems to have had a timid personality. We saw that in our previous study in 1 Timothy. But Paul had confidence in Timothy nonetheless, not because of Timothy, but because of Christ in Timothy. That's the reason this epistle is a triumphant epistle, a triumphant message. So Paul writes it to encourage him on. He reminds Timothy of his calling and responsibilities to guard the gospel and preach the word and of his God-given abilities to do that. He begins the letter with an indication of that from his own life. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Jesus Christ. Now that was Paul's customary way of beginning a letter, but it was not a mere formality. It was a statement filled with truth and grace and encouragement. And you see that at the very beginning where Paul speaks of his, of his calling. He was an apostle, not by his own will or his own choice, but by God's will. And that is a a suggestion, a clear suggestion of the sovereign grace of God that called him at a most unusual time, stopped him dead in his tracks on the road to Damascus when he had letters in his hand ready to find the Christians there and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and prison and perhaps death. And there on that road he stopped and turned around completely and made into a new man with a new mission. That wasn't his choice, that was God's. That was sovereign grace that not only called him out of darkness into light, made him the apostle to the Gentiles, but empowered him to do that. All of that is implied there. An apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And this ministry to which he was called is described as being according to the promise of life in Jesus Christ. That, that, that's the norm of his ministry. That's the aim of it, to preach life to the lost. That was God's will. And God's will cannot be frustrated. Oh, people can oppose it, and people can, can do harsh things as, as they were doing during this, the time that Paul was writing this letter, but ultimately it cannot succeed. God's word is true and God's word will stand. His will cannot be frustrated. His work cannot be destroyed. And so regardless of the situation in the dungeon in Rome with the persecution of the going on in the world and the defection and loss within the church, God's word will triumph. It will not fail. And so we're not to hold back, but to go forward in confidence with the promise of life, with the gospel. And we need to be reminded of that. Timothy needed it, and Paul will urge him to respond to it. But first he addresses Timothy with affection and with a prayer. To Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace is for the undeserving, mercy is for the helpless, and peace is for the fearful. Timothy needed all three. Paul knew that because he needed all three as we all do. The mission we are all on is one that we 
cannot do apart from the grace of God. And God would bless Timothy with that. He would bless Timothy with all three, with grace and mercy and peace, just as Paul prayed, which would have been a great comfort to that young man. In fact, God had already blessed Timothy greatly, as Paul reminds him in the remaining verses, but also Paul was always praying for him. He tells him that in verse 3 after he says how thankful he is for Timothy. I thank God as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Times were hard. People were turning from the truth. There was a lack of interest in the Bible, a lack of interest in doctrine, a disbelief in things that people had originally believed, and Timothy was discouraged and dejected. It's understandable. But you can, just, you can just imagine what it must have meant to him to read the Apostle Paul say, I am so thankful for you. I am praying for you night and day. You are a faithful man. It was a way of saying, Christ is pleased with you. Well, that would lift a person's spirits and inspire in them a, a desire to serve. And that was Paul's aim. He was trying to motivate Timothy, inspire Timothy to action and ministry. He was sincere in all that he said. One of Paul's great joys in that dark and dreary dungeon was Timothy, his son in the faith and his fellow worker in the gospel. Paul was always genuine in what he said. What he said to Timothy, what he was saying here, what he said to those to whom he preached. Always sincere and genuine. In between, I thank God and I remember you, he says that he served God with a clear conscience. The way his forefathers had done. They were faithful to the revelation they had, and Paul was faithful to the revelation he received. He, he was not in prison for a crime, but for serving God, for preaching the gospel, the promise of life. The message Paul preached was not his invention. It, it was the gospel, the only gospel, the good news. So just as Paul thanked Timothy... Honestly, he sat in chains with a clear conscience. What he suffered, he suffered for righteousness. And all of that would have inspired within Timothy a desire to do the same. The gospel and its preaching that, that may have come on hard times is the eternal truth of God. It is His revelation. It, of all things, in this world, is worth serving and suffering for. It has eternal benefits and eternal rewards. And so Paul prayed night and day for Timothy that he would do that. That his child in the faith would be faithful. That God would give him the grace to do that. Paul was devoted to Timothy. He was Paul's spiritual child, his beloved son, as he calls him in verse 2. And he says in verse 4 that he longed to see him. They had had an emotional parting. It happened maybe when Paul was arrested and taken away. Timothy was there evidently and shed tears that, that showed his his deep love and affection for the apostle. But it, it was his love for Christ that Paul was particularly thankful for, what, what he remembered and what he recalls in verse 5. Timothy's sincere faith, his genuine faith. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm sure that it is, within, it is in you as well. God makes us what we are 
does so by his sovereign grace, as I have said, but he uses means to do that. He uses people and he uses things to do it. His word is his chief means by which he changes us, by which he sanctifies us. He, he nourishes our soul through the word of God. That's why it is so vitally important that we be under the word of God, studying it routinely, that we be here with one another doing that. Sanctify them with the truth, Jesus prayed. Thy word is truth. And so this is the chief means by which he transforms us from glory to glory, as Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians. It says we, we see the Lord in his word that, that we are transformed into his image. That's the chief means by which he transforms and changes us. But he uses people also in our lives to teach us, to admonish us, to use the truth in, in ways like Paul was doing here with Timothy. And that, that should begin in the home. The most formative influence on a person's life is that of his or her parents. Ideally, with the father as the head of the home being the spiritual leader. And that, that's the standard that was set for Israel. It's given in the law. It's given in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6 to be specific. The responsibility was laid on the father to train up his son by his word and example. Mothers also had a, a significant role within Israel, and they do today. And sometimes they must take the lead spiritually when the father is absent or is an unbeliever. That seems to have been the case in Timothy's home. In Acts chapter 16 or verse 1, we learn that his father was a Greek, evidently an unbelieving man, a pagan man, but his mother and grandmother, who were both Jewish, were believers. And they both had a significant influence in Timothy's life. They, they taught him the Bible. And there are other examples of mothers and grandparents having a significant influence on a child's life. Monica is one example. I referred to her on more than one occasion. She was Augustine's mother. She, uh, too, was married to a pagan. But she was very spiritual. And she was very earnest in her faith and concern for her son, for her family. She prayed earnestly for Augustine, and, and she lived as a godly example before him and her husband. Augustine felt her influence, and shortly before her husband died, he became a believer. Susanna Wesley is another example of a godly mother. Her husband was often absent, sometimes in jail, in debtor's prison, and so she was left to take care of the children and to train them up. And there were a number of children in her family. And so she had to teach her sons, John and Charles, the Bible. And she did that and she supervised their education. She was a very, very formative influence in their lives. And grandparents have a part to play. H.A. Ironside wrote of an old faded photograph he had of his great-grandfather who was a farmer in Scotland. And he was told by people who had known his great-grandfather or had known of him how at the close of every day he would gather the family and the farmhands and have family worship. He always prayed for the salvation and blessing of his children and his children's children to the third and fourth generations. And Dr. Ironside said, I came in there. Well, that's a good thing for a parent and a grandparent to be doing, praying for their children and their children's children and on down. God answers those prayers. Parents and grandparents are very important. Mothers and fathers, very important to the life and the future of their children. After family, friends are the most influential people. And so it's important to pick friends well. Paul told the Corinthians that bad company corrupts good morals. 
It also follows that good company complements good morals. And Timothy not only had good influences in his family, but also from his friends. He was surrounded by good, faithful friends, and none more faithful than Paul himself. Paul prayed for Timothy all the time, night and day. Now that's a true friend. That's a true father in the faith. That's true concern. And like a good friend, he gave Timothy wise counsel. Tough counsel. Maybe not what Timothy wanted to hear, but what he needed to hear. He gives it in verse 6. He writes, Kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. In other words, because you have a sincere faith, you have a spiritual gift. Don't neglect it. Don't waste time and opportunities. Don't drift. Minister to people. Use your gift. Now Paul doesn't define the gift that Timothy had. The word that he uses is charisma. It's the word that is used of the spiritual gifts listed in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. So it may have been a gift of evangelism. More likely, it seems to me, the gift of pastor-teacher. Paul doesn't say, but he does say that Timothy received it through the laying on of hands, specifically, he says, of his hands that were laid on Timothy. He refers to that same event in 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, where he also told him not to neglect his spiritual gift. It was a, a reminder that Timothy had been equipped for the task. And that's true of all of us. God always equips us for what he has called us to do. And he's called all of us to serve him and serve one another. He's equipped us to do that. Timothy was equipped. But he had become shy about using his gift. Maybe he was intimidated by the persecution of the church by the state. Maybe the apostasy that he saw going on around him discouraged him. Whatever the circumstance, Timothy had become idle. This is the danger that, that we all face, I think, when times get tough. Even when, when times are good, it's also a challenge because we tend to get caught up in the good times and the blessings and the peace, and, and we enjoy that, and we can begin to drift then just as easily as it is when times are difficult. But we know that the circumstance of this young man was tough times, difficult times, challenging times. Thomas Paine's line, line about the, the times that try men's soul was followed by a warning that some men would become cowards when the, the war was real. He called them summer soldiers and sunshine patriots. He had a a, a way of turning a phrase. Uh, men, he's describing, who, who were brave when things were easy, but they left the field when the fight was dangerous. Well, there are men like that in the church. At the end of, of this letter, Paul will mention Demas, who deserted him, deserted Paul in Rome, and <clears throat> went home because Paul said he loved this present world. The time, it was difficult, you can imagine, being there with, with Paul, especially if he was in that Mamertine prison. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It is a grim place. And if that were the case, it would have been a hard thing for a man like Demas to, to do. And he longed for Thessalonica and the ease of it. And so he was drawn away. That happens to people. You know, tough times, good times. Uh, Timothy was not like that. Timothy was no summer soldier, but he was intimidated by the circumstances, and, and he needed some urging to be brave and get active. So Paul told him, 
Kindle afresh the gift that he had. The New International Version translates it, fan into flame. The, the gift is compared here to a, a fire. The flame hadn't gone out, but it, it was burning low and it needed to be stirred up. And so the picture that Paul gives us here is um, sticking a poker into the embers to, uh, to, to get the fire going, to start the flames that had uh, died down, or fanning the flames uh, to make it burn brighter. The exhortation is, is a good one for us. We all have a gift. We all have at least one gift, maybe more, but one gift for sure. They are from Christ, given to us by the Holy Spirit. The moment of faith, we are gifted. And the gift that we have, or the gifts that we have, are to be used. There are a variety of gifts and ministries. We, we don't all have the same gift. Just as to follow the analogy of the body that Paul uses. We're not all the same member. We're not all the eye or the ear. We, we're all a different part of the body. And so too, we all have different gifts. We have different functions, different nuances within the, the army of God and how we're to use our gifts and the spiritual weapons that we have. Well, there are a variety of gifts, a number of gifts. There are a basic categorization of them is utterance gifts and non-utterance gifts. The utterance gifts are gifts like evangelism and teaching, and the non-utterance gifts are gifts like mercy and helps. But God has given every Christian a spiritual gift, and the meetings of the church, this, this meeting, is to equip all of us to use our gifts in God's service. This isn't the end of the process. This isn't why we're here. This is for a further purpose. And Paul explains that in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. He wrote that God gave the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body. So this is to equip all of us to be engaged. We're all to minister. We're to go out from here and minister. We're to minister within the body and outside of the body. But that's uh, an unusual thought, I think, in this day. Uh, John Stott made a point of that. He uh, gave some unbiblical models of the church that are, are, are common ideas today. And one example is uh, uh, the model of a bus where the minister does all the driving in the congregation are passengers sleeping in the back. No, there's only one guy, we pay this guy, he does it. The biblical model, he said, is an every member ministry. We all have a service. Paul's counsel to Timothy is for us as well. Kindle afresh the gift of God. Stir it up. Fan the flame. Timothy needed to be told to do that. We all need that encouragement continually. We can drift from day to day. We can begin to drift at any time. All kinds of things can come into our life. The devil is at work to frustrate us in what we do and to keep these things from happening. So we all need this encouragement continually. And in verse 7, Paul adds further incentive for Timothy to do that, to fan the flame by giving him the reason for his counsel. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. That applies to all of us again. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been given the spirit of power. The question that we need to ask is the question that divides interpreters, translators, and commentators. What is that spirit that he refers to? Is it a new disposition that we have through the new birth? It is, it, is it the, a new attitude, the mind of Christ that we have in Christ, that we have as be, uh, people who are born again? Or is it the Holy Spirit? 
who has been given to each and every one of us, every believer? Well, probably, in my opinion, it is the Holy Spirit. That's consistent with passages like Romans 8, verse 15, where Paul says, we haven't received a spirit of slavery leading to fear, but a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. If you're familiar with Romans 8, you know that word spirit is found all through that book, uh, rather all through that chapter, and that chapter is the chapter on the Holy Spirit. And so every one of those references to spirit, well, that's something of the, the, the debate. All, most Everyone agrees almost all of those references are to the Holy Spirit. There may be one that isn't, or two, but um, many feel, I feel, that they're all references to the Holy Spirit, and that's what's referred to here in Romans 8, verse 15. J just as the Spirit gives us confidence in our sonship and causes us to cry out either audibly or inaudibly, but gives us this confidence of who we are that we can live as sons of God. That's the work of the Spirit within us. So too, He gives us power for service. So we're to be bold. We're to be like a fighting army. That's often how we're spoken of. Ephesians chapter 6 in particular, we have weapons that are in our hands and armor that we use to fight. I read just maybe three nights ago uh, the prologue of Rick Atkinson's book, An Army at Dawn, about the uh, American campaign in North Africa at the beginning of the Second World War. It's history, and he makes a point that he, he's, he's giving in this book, in fact, it's a trilogy, all three books, real history, the, the good and the bad in all of it, and not what he called a gauzy mythology. And he begins by describing the military cemetery in Carthage, Tunisia, and the 2,841 bone white marble mar markers Two feet high and arrayed, he said, in ranks as straight as gunshots. Many of the American soldiers buried there were heroes, but not all. At Carthage, he wrote, demigods and poltroons lie side by side. I thought poltroons, familiar with that word, but I can't remember it. That's an admission, I guess. And so I got my dictionary out and I looked it up, poltroon, coward. Even a, a great army like ours, greatest army of the 20th century, had poltroons as well as heroes. But in the Lord's army, the church, we should all be heroes. Not because we're so brave, not because of anything in our personal character, but because God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So Timothy had no excuse for allowing fear to control him. He was well equipped and, and was to act on the power of the spirit within him, the power that the spirit gives to him, to you, to me, to all of us. It wouldn't fail him because the spirit does not fail. Jesus told his disciples about this. He gave them something of a heads up, a warning in Mark chapter 13. He told them that they would, be, they would be persecuted. That they would be arrested, they'd be beaten, they'd be made to stand before governors and kings. And as he begins to describe this, that would ha what would happen to them in the future, you could imagine that that would probably intimidate them. That's enough to make a person a coward persecuted, arrested, tried, made to stand before people. But they weren't to worry about the situation. They weren't to worry about what they were to say because, he stated, it would be given to them. For it is not you who speak, Jesus said, but it is the Holy Spirit. That's the power that God gives. 
In such a situation, the Spirit of God is with us and He will enable us. Don't fear. When God called a young and very unconfident Jeremiah to be his prophet, he told him not to be afraid. He said, speak. Speak what I give to you. Speak what I tell you to speak. I have made you as a fortified city and as a pillar of iron and as walls of bronze. In other words, you're going to succeed. Just speak and be faithful. Now, uh, uh, now listen, of ourselves, as we think of the situation in life, the situation around us, we have every reason to be afraid and, and to shrink from the task that God has given us. Uh, it's, it's daunting, as you think of it, to be a witness to a world that is full of hostility or complete indifference. But wherever we are, that is what we are to do. We are to bear witness to the truth. And where we are in the church, we are to bear the heavy responsibility that the Lord has given us. Do not shirk from it, to, but to go forward. But again, we are not called to do that or anything of ourselves. The Lord makes us fit for the task and He gives us the power to stand and speak and succeed. I have said this numerous times. This is an appropriate place to say it again. The Christian life is not a natural life. It's a supernatural life. God lives within you if you're a child of God, if you're a believer, and He lives in you with power and He supplies it. So, look to Him. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy. We're to walk by faith and walk by the Spirit. He gives power and love and discipline. Power for self-control and power to love one another. Those three are what is needed for effective service. Now, as I think about this, think about the, the challenge really to all of us to make use of the gift that God has given to us, I thought maybe we really don't need to worry so much about what our calling is and what our spiritual gift is. We can become really consumed with finding that out and wondering what we should do before we get busy doing anything for the Lord. I think instead what we should do is make it our purpose to know the saints and to love God's people. If you love someone, you take an interest in them. You get to know them, you ask about them, you pray for them like Paul did for Timothy. You help them where and when you can. And as we do that, opportunities for ministry open up. And as we take those opportunities, we learn what we are effective at doing and, and what our gift and our special service for the Lord is. In verse 1, Paul said, the aim of his ministry was to proclaim the promise of life in Christ Jesus. And that really is the ministry of, of all of us, to lead the lost to life and to nurture that life in the saints, to be an encouragement to one another, and to help one another. Are you doing that? We need to apply this to ourselves, and, and, and we do that with a question. Are we doing that? You, you, you don't have to be a preacher to do that or a teacher to do that. Do you pray for others? That is the effective means God has given us to obtain blessings for ourselves and for one another. We need to do that. We need to be men and women of prayer for ourselves and for one another, for this place and for places beyond here. The Lord has saved you saved you not only to live with Him in heaven, but to serve with Him on earth. Maybe you've forgotten that, gotten distracted. We all do. Maybe begun to drift a bit. That, that is the case with all of us at some point or another. If so, I don't know that that's true of any of you, but if so... Fan the flame within to serve Him. Get to know the Lord. Be here consistently Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings. 
Study His Word daily. Act on it. Get to know God's people. The life God has given you is one of power. Power for personal control and power to bless others. Act on that. The church needs you just as much as it needed Timothy. We live in times that try men's souls. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, Psalm 27 is for you. David began that psalm, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And of course, the, the, the question he asks is to be answered, well, no one. I'm to fear no one. So David ends the psalm, be strong and let your heart take courage. May we all do that. Can you say that the Lord is your stronghold? If you've not believed in Christ as the eternal Son of God, as your Creator and your Savior, you cannot say that He is your stronghold. You are on your own in a dangerous world full of uncertainty and a life that is very brief. The promise of life, eternal life, is in Christ Jesus, as Paul said in verse 1. Trust in Him if you haven't done that. He died for all who do, he gained forgiveness for all who trust in Him. He receives all who trust in Him. May God help you to do that and then help you and all of us to kindle that gift within us and to serve the Lord and serve one another. It has eternal blessing and reward. Let's sing hymn number 35 in conclusion out of the Songs of Praise book, O Church, Arise. Let's arise to do that and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 35. Father, we have that great hope of Christ's return and of us standing with Him in glory. That's the end of it all. That's how it will end in triumph. We look forward to that day. In the meantime, may we not waste time. May we not, as we considered last week, trifle. May we arise, may we stand as we've just sung and serve you and serve those around us. We'll do that by your grace. We pray for that. And we thank you for your son, for his death for us, and obtaining the victory for us once and for all at the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen.